The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. Major support for Compass is provided by the ongoing support of the Leo P. Flynn Estate of Millbank, South Dakota. Additional support is provided by the Southwest Minnesota Private Industry Council, promoting Southwest Minnesota as a place rich with opportunity. Come for the jobs, stay for the lifestyle. More information at swmnpic.org. Welcome to Compass, a production of Pioneer Public Television. I'm Les Heen, your host for Compass. It's a weekly discussion of public policy and important issues facing our viewing area. This week, we'll talk about how food co-ops are gaining in popularity in our region. We'll have a representative from the Palm de Terre Food Co-op, and we'll talk about the impact that co-ops can have on the lives of communities in rural Minnesota. First, Pioneer's Laura K. Prosser will show you why distribution and partnerships are so important for the success of co-ops. We'll take a look at the Fresh Connect Food Hub. Here's Laura's report. So now we've all heard of food co-ops, but the Fresh Connect Food Hub in Fergus Falls is a little different than your average variety. The hub is part of the Lakes Country Service Cooperative and works as a distributor of locally grown produce to local schools, nursing homes, resorts, and even hospitals, while providing training, technical assistance, and marketing to growers and customers alike. Jeremy Kovash and Janine Bowman are here to tell us a little bit about it. Janine, Jeremy, welcome. Thank, Thank you, Laura. Let's start with you telling me a little bit about the Fresh Connect Food Hub and we'll why it was first thought up. Sure, we started working with SHIP, which is the statewide health improvement program, mm -hmm. several years ago, and they, they are a partner of the Minnesota Department of Health. We have a 30-year history of working with those folks, and for many years, uh, food service directors talked to us about how can we get locally grown foods on the tables of our students. And it kind of started with a question about if we're going to address chronic health issues and uh, healthier students and healthier schools, why not start with teaching kids about the value of locally grown foods, local produce, and teach them an appreciation for fine foods. That's wonderful. Now, you're on the ground with the kids dealing with their experiences with fresh food. What has that been like? How have the kids reacted to being exposed to locally grown produce? I think the variety that we can get from the Food Hub um, has made a big difference for our kids. They see different things every week. Sometimes they're seeing the same thing, but when it comes in fresh, it tastes different. You know, the kids know the difference between a fresh apple that was just picked or one that's been in a warehouse for quite a while. So what do you hope that people get out of this and that the schools get out of a food hub like this? First of all, we hope that there's a constant bridge between food service distributors, uh, growers, and then providers. And we hope that we can continue to build that bridge, that that uh, not only will serve our schools, but cities, counties, and, and other facilities, as you've talked about as well, hospitals and nursing homes. We really hope we can get and continue to drive more local foods into our communities. Probably most importantly for us is uh, the education. We hope that future generations of children know and understand that uh, food can be delivered locally, it can be grown locally, and it can be healthy and good for them as well. So Janine, what do you hope the schools get from a partnership like this? We actually get the ability to serve the food to our kids and it becomes the norm. It's no longer, it's just a farm to school item that we serve once a year or twice a year. It's what we always serve. We serve apples that are farm to school from the food hub or from other places all year until January. So really the first apples they get are fresh from the orchards. You know, they're serving squash that came directly out of the field and it's maybe a couple days old. It's not weeks old. 
you know, or months old. So the food actually tastes fresh and they do notice the difference. What they can get in a Happy Meal and what they can have straight from a farm, I'm sure it tastes completely different. It really does. And the variety that we get. You know, just having kids know that tomatoes aren't just red, that they are orange and yellow and purple, you know, and have all these other colors out there, you know, along with carrots and all those things. It just makes a big difference. So how did you reach out to different businesses and organizations to start this program and to keep it going? Partnership leveraging is very important. No one entity could do this alone. We have many partnerships here, Laura, at Lakes Country. But first of all, we would not have been able to do this without a couple of grants that we qualified for and were awarded by the Department of Agriculture. So those grants helped us with our capital items, uh, such as our production facility. And then secondly, our food truck. So the distribution network certainly helped us. So we really needed those grants to get us going. In addition, we received a grant from the Bush Foundation to help us with operational expenses right up front. And then we've had a continued and long-term partnership with, with SHIP, the Statewide Health Improvement Program. And then on the, on the research and technical side, or the technical needs side, uh, our burgeoning and growing and everlasting partnership with the University of Minnesota Extension. And they provide a lot of that technical assistance. Janine, what kind of benefits have you seen yourself from this kind of partnership and these kind of education efforts? I mean, I'm sure the schools themselves are working hard to educate themselves, but sometimes having a little bit of a helping hand going, hey, did you hear about this new, new product coming out or did you hear about this new education technique? What kind of benefits have you seen? It has really helped us because we have professional standards that we have to meet. So there's all these trainings that we're required to go to. But with the ever-changing issues of meeting the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010, you know, with rules changing every year, it really helps us keep up to date on those. Just having the trainings to be able to go to. And with our kids, with the education, offering us you know, insights into what can we do to keep our kids informed. You've seen the kids' responses, but what kind of responses have you seen from a community that has this hub right in its center? I think we've really captured the imagination and well wishes of our community. They continue to, I think, marvel at our innovation and partnerships and opportunities. And, and at the end of the day, uh, Laura, parents and our members want healthier foods. They want locally grown, nutrient-dense food uh, that tastes great as well and so I think we're providing that and I think our community and our school members and our members have been continue to be very excited about it and the, and the potential for growth. Well thank you so much Jeremy and Janine for joining us. I'm Laura K. Prather, producer of Compass and that's it for us in Fergus Falls. We're gonna go back to the studio with Les. And with us now to talk about regional food co-op trends and the challenges they face our guest is Arna Kildegard. Arna is from the Palm de Terre Co-op in Morris. Arna, thanks for joining us on Compass. Well, thank you for inviting me, Les. Yeah. So, uh, food co-ops have been around for a long time, and of course, um, before the, we started this discussion, we were just sitting around, we talked about the fact that we heard about food co-ops in the Twin Cities, and they, they've been around the 60s and 70s, but now we're seeing more of them in small towns. So what's your experience with the food co-op in Morris? Well, so I, I moved to the region in 2001, and um, uh, you know, you notice right away that it, that uh, it's not, uh, in terms of fine dining alternatives, it's not exactly a food mecca, um, and and sort of surprisingly, there 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 wasn't, it wasn't really very easy to get a hold of locally grown foods. I mean, here we are, we're surrounded by some of the best agricultural land in the country. And yet, uh, the, the, the um, vegetables you see in your standard grocery store are imported from Chile or some, something like that. And, and um, um, you know, some of the people I met uh, right away were were foodies, and uh, they, you know, I, I wasn't really initially part of that orbit, but uh, I, I came to appreciate sort of the connection to the source of your own food and what that means in terms of how it's produced, the, the, how humanely it's produced, and above all, the thing that trumps all of the considerations is how much better it tastes. So I got, I got connected to that right away through the local co-op, the Pomme de Terre Food Co-op in Morris, which um, 
uh, was started back in the 70s in somebody's broom closet, uh, and it has been going out of business for some 40 years now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know, it's interesting because some communities food co-ops make it, yep. and other communities they don't, and some, some they make it for a little while, and they get the money, and it seems to be working, and, yep. that, and then it falls apart, and others, like in the Morris case, yep. survive for a long time. But it sounds like the, the, uh, there's not necessarily a lot of insurance that they will survive. Well, it's a tough market. Grows the grocery business generally is uh, operates on very thin margins, and uh, you know there's kind of there's a there's stiff competition. Um, uh, what makes it you know what makes it possible to drive prices down is, first of all, mass production. On the agriculture side, and second of all, high volume at the retail side, and uh, the co-ops. That's not really the niche they occupy for the most part uh, often they're they're doing relatively low turnover per you know square foot of shelf space or something like that uh, and they're and they're sourcing some of their materials from local producers who are not doing everything in their power to to you know confine as many animal animals in as small a space as possible yeah so it's it's really it's a niche market clearly Mm -hmm. um, and like a lot of cooperatives that have started up in the history of cooperatives, isn't this largely about organizations that started to meet a need that the rest of the marketplace wasn't meeting? I think that's right. I think that uh, you know the sort of original philosophy behind cooperatives was to organize the need, and it's hard to make one go in a in a community where where the need is already being serviced by the by the private market somehow. Um, but uh, but it continues to have a role in uh, both, it, particularly in this in this niche of connecting people to where their food comes from, uh, and, you know, to, to connecting farmers to consumers, and uh, and uh, helping people sort of understand, um, you know, what that what that means for the quality of the water and the quality of the soil and the quality of the air, and the, above all, the quality of the food. And also part of, I would figure, the larger food culture, which is to say people having a greater interest in flavor. Mm -hmm. Because if, if a food mm -hmm. transfers a shorter distance, and this isn't necessarily a criticism of large groceries, but the idea mm -hmm. is, you know, if that tomato comes out of a local farmer's field mm -hmm. or a tomato comes yeah. out of my garden, yeah. there's a taste difference between that and one that's traveled from yeah, California. It's no, really true. It's really true. When I was a kid, the one food I could not choke down was, a, was an egg. I can remember that, you know, pit in my stomach when I'd come down to breakfast and mom would have eggs on the table and you know in my family it wasn't really permissible to not like something right sure. so you, I had to you had, I, you I had, had to, you eat. Had to eat what was, there. was what it was and uh, and then I was visiting a friend in uh, Austin Wisconsin and they sent me out to pick up the eggs out of the hen house and it was just like the light bulbs went on you know and the sun emerged from behind the glass it was a completely different food and uh, I still feel that way about sort of your your uh, mass-produced eggs versus the locally raised chickens and eggs that we that we have at our food co-op. So that's that's one you know pristine example of well, how that a, works. And it's also a common theme I think among so many of the rural people that, that that you and I know that they grew up with you know their own eggs, own meat, mm -hmm. food out of their garden. So in right. some way it's sort of a return to rural roots for a number of them because that that flavor that memory is very mm -hmm. important to them yeah. and as such they're often willing to pay more to have it through a, a cooperative or a local yeah. food distributor yeah. it's largely about the flavor you know there's a, there's just an enormous difference in, in what a chicken tastes like that's been running around in somebody's yard versus one that was raised by you know I don't want to pick on the mass producers but uh, it's an enormous difference in in taste and then you know uh, over time, I've come to feel like, you know, the life of that chicken probably matters, too. And the time it had on earth scratching a worm out of the dirt, you know, that's not such a bad thing if a chicken did, can do that. Yeah. Well, and I think that, that for a lot of people in, in the food movement, it's been, it's been flavor-driven. There are other reasons. But, um, again, if that's a particular need or they say, well, I, you know, I, I like this type of a flavor. It may be heritage turkeys. It mm -hmm. may be a particular variety of tomato. Uh, and those may be things that are less, uh, they're more difficult to find mm -hmm. in, in a traditional market. And that's what you've got in co-ops, I, I expect, is a lot of those that's things. That's what that we're that, trying to do. And it's, I mean, it's not an easy problem to get food from the farm to the grocer, get it sold before it goes bad. Produce is notoriously difficult for people who are professional grocers. 
and a lot of co-ops are not really professionals in that way. So it's, so it's a hard problem. I don't want to undersell that, yeah. uh, but I feel like it's worthwhile. And, um, you know, one of the things we do at our co-op is we have a, we have a monthly potluck. And that's a, that's a reason to bring together a bunch of people who aren't necessar necessarily from the same backgrounds. We have, a, uh, we have somebody do a presentation, somebody from the local foods community do a presentation. Um, last month it was the, uh, the woman from Redhead Creamery up in Bruton, I think it is, um, and, and, and so on and so forth. So it, it, gives, it gives all of us gathered a chance to meet somebody who's actually on the production end. It gets the production people a chance to meet uh, you know, who their final consumers are, and it, and it builds community. So I think that's an important part of the picture too. Yeah, starting a conversation about food, starting a relationship around food, mm -hmm. you know, which is a, very much an important societal tradition that we often gather around food and then have a discussion about where did this come from, mm -hmm. how did you produce it, how could it be cooked, how should it be prepared, what are the other ways to do it, and so I expect that there's a, a large social component to it as well. Absolutely, it's a very civilized thing. Yeah. So what's the future of, of, of the economics of cooperatives, because I know from time to time you know, there'll be these sort of blips on the screen where people say, oh, what's mm -hmm. happening with co-ops? Are they still making it? Is it still fitting the niche? Because mm -hmm. the grocery world has changed a ton. There's a lot more that's available in grocery stores. So what about the economics of co-ops today? Well, it's a tough question. I think, uh, you know, co-ops span everything from sort of micro co-ops, like the one that I'm most familiar with, to something like the Wedge in the Twin Cities, which does tens of millions of dollars in, and, and in all annual these are revenue. Food, all these are food co-ops, so I should say, yeah, food co-ops. Is that what you're asking me about, yeah, food co-ops? Yeah, food co -ops? Co -ops, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so in, in some ways, we're playing in, on completely diff different terms. Um, uh, the rural co-ops keep their costs reasonable by using a lot of volunteer labor, um, um, members who will staff the register or will take off, take on some piece of the work. You know, this person does the cheese ordering, this person does the produce ordering, um, and maintains the relationships with the farmers, and so on and so forth. So, so you know, you can't beat zero labor costs, right? I mean, that's <laughs> that's you, a competitive if, advantage. If you've right? got volunteers on one side, the economics start to work out. They start to work better, right? Right. Uh, the I mean, a lot, our co-op, like a lot of co-ops, uh, continues to stock um, local produce and that kind of thing, but also bulk foods, which are very competitively priced. We have a lot of uh, sort of more boutique products that are for the food connoisseur, you know, exotic oils and spices from remote parts of the world. You might, you might not find them in, your, in the grocery store two blocks away. Uh, but those are not cheap, right? And that's so I, I think sometimes we get a reputation for being expensive because people look at a salad oil and say, you know, why is that thirteen dollars when, when I can get, you know, when I can get um, safflower oil for you know two ninety nine over at the grocery store. Uh, so I mean, some of, some of the things we we vend are actually cheaper. I like to say they're all better, but um, but some of them but but some of them are you know, niche um, boutique products. Yeah, yeah. Th things that you're not going to find elsewhere. Right. And so people may walk by and say, well, and they may, may not necessarily appreciate the distinction in the quality or the difference, and that's, that's where you run into, into the issues. Exactly. Um, national trends, local trends, regional trends in food cooperatives. What are you seeing there? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, there, I was just at a co-op conference a couple of weekends ago in the Twin Cities organized by North Country Cooperative Foundation, and um, I saw there's tremendous energy around it still. There, there were probably half a dozen groups there who were in the startup phase, who were trying to do a capital subscription to get started. One of them in North Minneapolis, uh, one of them up by Aiken. Um, couple down in Iowa, I think it was Cedar Rapids, Cedar Rapids, Cedar Falls, something like that. Um, uh, so people continue to be interested in this sort of grassroots approach to, to uh, you know, building the food system out. And that's, that's encouraging to hear. Uh, the old war horses who've been at it forever, you know, oscillate between, you know, uh, being optimistic and being, you know, uh, weary of the whole thing, so it's it's a mixed bag. But uh, but their their co-op movement is not going anywhere. Yeah. So based on what they say now about what's going on, and based on your own experience, 
if someone is thinking about this and saying, hmm, how would I start a food cooperative in my town? Mm -hmm. Where do they start? Where do they start? Well, let's see, there is a, uh, there's a website called Cooperative Grocer Network. I think it's cooperativegrocer.coop, C-O-O-P. You probably didn't even know that's a I did not. Yeah, suffix. Well, I, yeah, that, <laughs> yeah, that's an unusual web. It's like there's actually a .tv as well, but right. we digress. So .coop, yes. Dot co uh, and they are a tremendous resource for sort of all aspects of it, how to organize the co-op, how to get legally situated, how to, con how to construct your member dividend payments, um, how to you know, how to do your pricing, how to do your ordering, you know, thoughts about what your end caps should look like and interior, you know, I mean, about, um, about, about how the store should operate and whether you should have volunteers or paid staff. Uh, there are, there's volumes of extremely relevant information on that site. North, uh, there's also North Country Cooperative Foundation, which I mentioned a minute ago, is the organizer of this co-op in the Twin Cities, of this conference in the Twin Cities. And they are a association of uh, sort of very well-informed cooperative uh, specialists who hire themselves out for consulting projects. And the knowledge base there is tremendous. So I'm, uh, I'm sure they have some startup resources available also. I haven't investigated that. Well, good advice and a lot of hard work ahead. We know that for anyone who's going to start. Right. Okay, great. Arna Kildegard, Palm de Terre Co-op, thanks for joining us. All right, thank you, Les. Great, great discussion. That's it for this week on the topic of food co-ops in rural areas. Our Compass producer, Laura K. Prosser, will take it from here. And she'll end this week's episode with the next installment of the Compass Literature Corner. Thanks for watching. As part of the new segment to the show called the Compass Literature Corner, we will be talking to local authors and writers who have had an impact on this region or whom this region has had an impact on. This week's guest is a man who has checked off a bucket list item with his first book at the age of 55 and kept right on writing. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to say today's guest is Wilmer resident and author Forrest Peterson. Forrest, welcome. Hi, Laura. Thanks for having me. So, Forrest, you are the author of Buffalo Ridge, a novel. Right. This is your second book. Correct. So tell me a little bit about what inspired you to start writing at the age of 55. Well, I, all my life I'd always wanted to be an author. Uh, I have been a journalist, a reporter, an editor for 20 years, and, uh, and I still work in public communication. So I guess in that sense I've been writing for the public my entire adult career. But... Uh, many journalists kind of harbor an ambition to be novelists and, and uh, authors someday. So, so why don't you tell us a little bit about what Buffalo Ridge is about? Well, it's kind of set in the uh, early 2000s in western Minnesota. And the idea was to create a story around a, a young family uh, in, a, in a rural community uh, facing some difficult issues. And uh, that's basically what many stories are about is conflict and resolution, but hopefully there's a good message at the end. In this case, the theme is uh, uh, children and how ch uh, the resilience of children in growing up in a world sometimes marred by poor choices by adults and the struggles they face in uh, working and raising a family. So that's kind of the basis of that story. Community is key. When you're writing for the newspaper, when you're writing a book, it's all about community and people's connections to each other. So what about a good foundation of a community or family is key for Buffalo Ridge? Well, it, I think as a lot of people will agree that you know, families and communities are really the foundations of society. And we all uh, live together and work together and support each other. And so I try to tell that kind of a story and it may seem like these might be ordinary people, but I think ordinary people have some of the best stories to tell. If you uh, walk down the street and you could pick out anyone at random and if you got into their lives and their stories, everyone would be fascinating. So trying to portray that in an interesting way uh, is what I'm trying to do. You mentioned in the break that a lot of what you're writing, you know, as 
as an old newspaper person mm -hmm. and as an environmentalist, you have been able to put some of your own experiences or your own just views and perspectives of environment and everything else into your book. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I think all artists and authors, obviously, do, they do draw on their own experiences, which is uh, where we draw um, you know, much material, but also what we learn and see in the community. As a news, former you know, newspaper person, one thing I really strive to do is to keep these stories uh, feasible so they're not fantasy or, or that type of uh, genre, but uh, I've had people say that to me about some of these stories, even though sometimes you might stretch the, the truth or the facts a little bit, they'll say, you know, that, that's all feasible. And so that's important to me as a, as a former journalist to have fiction stories but somewhat based on reality. So. If it's feasible, a lot of people use, you know, reading as an escape. They use it to escape reality. Were you ever worried when you were striving for feasibility that your audience would be like, well, why do I want to read this? I want, I want something that's, you know, fantasy or unrealistic. I don't want to read about everyday life. Well, I think, I think people relate to other people, though, in that way, you know, even as a uh, newspaper person when we write stories, so-called feature stories about people, those are some of the most read stories that we, that we heard about and uh, so people just like to read about other people and even though these might be fictional characters they can often relate to them and the things that they're experiencing. But at the same time we try to have positive uplifting endings <laughs> so that while there's conflict there is resolution, there's there's redemption, there's forgiveness, and all that kind of stuff. So I think people like that as well. A little bit of a happy ending, even if reality isn't always a happy ending, right? right? As stated, this right. is your second book, but right. you are also working on a third book. Tell us a little bit about that. Right, well, I'm hoping to finish that this summer, and uh, I decided to place the setting of that one actually in Iowa. <laughs> and, uh, but it's somewhat similar in the sense that it's a rural area, uh, you know, families, uh, there's a situation involving a foreign animal disease outbreak on a farm and uh, what's interesting about this story though is, and I really didn't know this was going to happen until I started writing it, but one of the main characters turned out to be an Iranian student at the uh, Iowa State University in Ames. So as, as I was writing, I said, well, I need to learn more about the students from Iran. So I actually made some contacts down there, went to uh, Iowa and interviewed several. So where can people find your book and where can they expect to see your new book out in this next year? Good Ice, my first book is on Kindle. I'm hoping to get Buffalo Ridge on Kindle soon. Uh, they're available from uh, various bookstores. They've been out for a while so I need to re get, get those restocked. Uh, they're also available from me. I do have a website, it's just basically my name. It's a forest with two R's, forestpeterson.com. So anyone could look on there and get all that contact information. If you want to keep with your rural roots, pick up any one of Forrest's books, past, present, and future. That's it for us in the Compass Literature Corner. Please tune in next week for more people, places, and issues facing our viewing area. I'm Pioneer's Laura K. Prosser, and may your compass always point you in the direction of a good book. Major support for Compass is provided by the ongoing support of the Leo P. Flynn Estate of Millbank, South Dakota. Additional support is provided by the Southwest Minnesota Private Industry Council, promoting Southwest Minnesota as a place rich with opportunity. Come for the jobs, stay for the lifestyle. More information at swmnpic.org.